I have this handheld Veo from 2004, and on here I'm running the tablet edition of Windows XP. And it runs really well on here, because this machine was designed for Windows XP. But I had to install the tablet edition myself, because Sony only ever shipped this machine with the standard version of Windows XP. And despite this thing having no built-in keyboard and just a touchscreen, they still didn't use the tablet edition of Windows XP. And I find that really odd, because Tablet XP came out in 2003, the year before this machine was released. The time has come though to start trying some more modern operating systems on here and see just what this little thing is capable of. But this is going to be very difficult because this machine doesn't like to boot from external USB drives. In fact, last time when I was installing Windows XP tablet, I had to resort to doing a network boot. This involves using another computer to host the ISO of the new operating system. This then allows the computer to boot via the network adapter, and the install process happens over the network. Now, I'd rather not go through that process again, because I found it rather finicky to set up, and I did have some problems booting some ISOs over the network. So I've been having another look at the USB boot options. And I do have the original Sony USB floppy disk drive, and this works really well, and it will boot any floppy disk. The problem comes when I try to boot from any other USB device. For testing, I've gone into the BIOS and made sure that it is set to boot from USB floppy and CD-ROM drives. I've also temporarily turned off booting from the internal hard disk as I test various USB boot options without the machine constantly booting into Windows XP. I've tried various USB CD-ROM drives and none of them will boot on here. I've also tried various USB flash memory sticks. I even tried using a third party USB floppy disk drive like this Toshiba one and the system does boot fine from this. I even tried the Plop bootloader. This is famous for being able to boot almost any system over USB, but not this one. But that's not really Plop's fault, because the BIOS in this machine will not execute any boot code unless it's coming from a floppy disk. And I tested this by changing the boot sector on this floppy disk this is a tiny fractal generator that's been squished into the spare bytes in the 512 byte boot sector. This is quite an amazing achievement and I love this sort of thing. To be sure I was installing these properly, I was also testing them on my Fujitsu to make sure they are bootable USB devices. All of this tells me that the BIOS in this machine has been hard coded to only run boot code from a floppy. If there is a way to get a USB flash memory stick to identify like a USB floppy drive, then I certainly haven't found it. If anyone knows more about what's going on here, be sure to let me know in the comments below. So armed with only a floppy disk, it's time to boot a new operating system. And today I'm going to be running Linux on this machine. And there we have it. I now have a much more modern operating system running on my Veo. Okay, maybe that's not the end of the video. Because I've recently received something that's going to help me boot ISOs on this computer. I have here the intended DVD drive for this computer. This is the Sony iLink DVD drive. iLink is the IEEE 1394 interface. This is normally used for digital camcorders. Apple adopted this interface standard as well, and they branded it Firewire on their machines. With Sony's version, they typically use a four pin iLink connector, and in this case, a separate power connector, which I can then plug into the back of the dock that the Veo sits in. The other end has the same two connectors, which I can plug into the DVD drive. And with that, I should be able to boot just about any ISO that's been burned to an optical disk. And that means it's now time to actually try installing Linux on here. 
I'm going to try burning these ISOs onto this verbatim CDRW. Now this computer does have a 32-bit CPU, which is going to limit some of the Linux distros that I'm able to install. And I still have some 32-bit ISOs from when I was installing Linux on the Fujitsu phone. Some of these are older versions of Linux distros, and a good place to start. And the first ISO I'm running here is a version of Puppy Linux, and immediately it reports a problem. It's telling me the CPU is unsupported for PAE, and this means physical address extension. And this problem is also what stops newer versions of Windows being installed on this computer. All these operating systems are checking for PAE support in the CPU before beginning the install process. With Windows, this is a big problem, but for Linux, I should be able to overcome this. And that's because this computer has a Pentium M CPU, and the Pentium M does actually include physical address extension support. It's just that this feature is not included in the CPU flags that operating systems look for when they're checking that the CPU is supported. I then burned a copy of Arch Linux. which also gave me a hint that I could use the force PAE option as one of the boot flags. This allowed me to get past the error and move further into the boot process. Though I pretty soon had another problem, with the installer no longer able to see the CD-ROM drive. Now I'm not sure, but I think this could be related to this being an iLink or Firewire based optical drive. Though I couldn't investigate this any further because now the USB keyboard is no longer responding. And coming up against all these issues are really helping me to learn different aspects of Linux. So while researching different ways to get all this working, I thought I might try the latest version of Debian. They still make a 32-bit version of what is arguably one of the most foundational versions of Linux. So I download Debian 11 and burn it to my rewritable disk. And from there, I get this really nice text-based installer. In fact, the whole setup process feels really good. I also noticed that Debian didn't complain about not detecting the PAE CPU flag, which has made me kind of curious. Is Debian detecting that this is a Pentium M CPU and already knows it has PAE support despite not being in the CPU flags? I'm really enjoying this installer. It's a nice mix between easy defaults and more complex options. Debian also needs to connect to the network to complete the installation, and it gives me the option between using Wi-Fi or wired Ethernet. Since this video uses a very early Wi-Fi adapter, I've decided to go for wired internet. So I'm gonna need a cat. And I didn't actually mean that cat. I meant this really skinny cat six cable which I can plug into the Ethernet port at the back of the dock. The installer then connects to the internet and starts downloading the rest of the packages. I'm going with all the default settings, including the default graphical user interface, which in this case is called GNOME. And with that, everything installed really beautifully. The system starts up fine, and everything just seems to work. Even the touchscreen works, though it does seem to need some calibration. I really like the design and layout of this system. It all feels really modern. Though I have to admit, it does run very sluggish on this system. And I think that's to be expected because the recommended memory for this setup is two gigabytes. And this computer only has half a gigabyte of RAM, which starts to become really noticeable when it takes 20 seconds just to bring up a terminal. So that means it's time to install one of the alternative graphical user interfaces. And from here, I can use apt-get to install another GUI. I'm gonna go with the Mate desktop. I used this interface when I was installing Linux on the Fujitsu phone, so I already have some experience with it. And with that all installed, I simply reboot the system, and on the login screen, I now have the option to start the Mate desktop. And this does seem to be running much faster than the previous desktop, though it certainly doesn't look quite as nice. 
Most things seem to be running fine, including the touch screen, though I've noticed that unlike with the GNOME desktop, I can't seem to adjust the screen brightness with this desktop. The other thing is I'm not sure how to bring up an on-screen keyboard if I want to use this in handheld mode. If you have any suggestions for a good lightweight graphical user interface that I can run on Debian that includes really good touchscreen support and an on-screen keyboard, then let me know in the comments below. I'd like to take a moment to appreciate the display on this Veo and just how thin the resistive touchscreen actually is. There's almost no distance between the LCD and the outside touchscreen. From what I understand, this is only one of two Veos that Sony ever made that includes an in-house LCD, instead of all the other Veo models which used outsourced LCDs. From what I read, this is a really high quality LCD that was manufactured by Sony's own personal digital assistant and phones division. But for now, I wanna try out some software. So I'm going straight to the package manager. And the first software that I wanna install is MAME, the arcade emulator. And I really like the way Linux detects all the extra packages you need to install something and automatically adds them to the installation process. It's a really good part of the experience. And with that, I easily get MAME installed on here. Probably not the best software to be running on such an old machine because MAME seems to run really slowly on here. Even the basic menu system is all unfortunately really slow. But I'm going to persevere with this, because as some people have pointed out in the comments, this Veo does look like a giant Nintendo Game & Watch. And MAME now includes the ability to simulate Game & Watch games. And with everything loaded into the right folders, I'm now able to run these games on here. But they do run extremely slowly. MAME emulation and simulation has generally been focused on accuracy and precision of the games it's running. And those things are very important. I just wish there was a way to optimize some of these systems. For example, I've noticed that the Game & Watch games are rendering their graphics in a resolution of 1647 by 1080, but the LCD on this Veo is 800 by 600. If I could find a way to render these games at a lower resolution, I might be able to get some better speed out of these games. I also tried running them without their background artwork effects, and this does speed up the game speed somewhat, but it doesn't look nearly as nice. I really can't fault MAME for all the things they're doing for these old games, but I would like to find a way to run these sorts of handheld games on lower powered handheld systems. Nintendo Game & Watch games run on a 4-bit CPU that runs at a tiny 16 kilohertz, but that's not the part that's running really slow on this Veo. It's all the original hand-drawn graphics and LCD elements that are being simulated on here that the CPU and GPU are just unable to keep up with. And while there's no D-pad in the bottom left side of the screen, there is a four-way button input on the top right of the screen. That means you could turn the whole Veo around and have a four-way controller in the bottom left, just like a Game & Watch. And with that, I'm gonna end this video here. And while I didn't achieve my goal of turning this into a Nintendo Game & Watch, I certainly learned more about using Linux in the process. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting the channel. Don't forget I've got a Patreon if you're into that sort of thing. And I'm going to end this video with a time lapse that I made of one of my favourite Game & Watch games. That's it, and I'll see you next time.